everybody, welcome to Bone to Pick. I am Michael Davis, and we are coming to you today from beautiful, sunny Los Angeles, California. And I am thrilled and honored to have the opportunity to interview one of the great trumpet players of all time. He's certainly one of the most respected players here in Los Angeles and one of the most recorded trumpet players, the great Gary Grant. He has played on hundreds and hundreds of motion picture soundtracks, television credits, uh, just to name a few. Goodfellas, Forrest Gump, Austin Powers, Men in Black, The Simpsons, The Academy Awards. Uh, it's tons and tons of work. His CD credits read like a who's who of popular music and includes Barbara Streisand, Frank Sinatra, Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson, Earth, Wind & Fire, Al Jarreau, some of my favorite recordings you've done, Toto. Uh, there's hundreds more. It's just an amazingly prolific career. He's been a member of the, for my money, the greatest horn section of all time, the Jerry Hay horn section for about 35 years. He's been Quincy Jones' lead trumpet player for 20 years. He is a Grammy-winning producer. Uh, he has two CDs out as a solo artist. He's one of the greatest spirits uh, I have ever run across. He is a true, uh, passionate musician and, and just done amazing work. So, Gary, thank you so much for taking time out of your exceptionally busy schedule to uh, sit down and talk to us today. Thank you, Mike, for having me. And, and actually, I wasn't doing anything today, so this is perfect. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm so honored to be amongst these great mu musicians you have uh, on uh, Hip Bone, and uh, they're, they're just a top quality, and I'm, I'm really honored to be asked to be a part of this. Well, thank you. Thank you, Gary. It's, uh, it's indeed our honor to, to have you here, and this is going to be great. Um, maybe we can jump right in, and I, in preparing for the interview, I got to learn more about you myself, and uh, I understand you were a fourth generation of professional musicians, and maybe you could talk about just growing up and how what made you gravitate to the trumpet. Obviously, you were around music uh, a lot. Then. I was both my father, who was Harry Grant, and my mother, Alice Grant, was my mother was a pianist. My father played all the instruments. He uh, was a professional musician. He actually uh, traveled with Duke's band for a short while and Tommy Dorsey's band as a trombonist. Uh, he was with the Ringling Brothers Circus uh, band before the f uh, before the fire, and that's. Um, uh, and then you know he was on the road, and we were we had a, a pretty big family of four kids, and. And uh, my mom said, you know, you need to come home. So he came home and, and became a, a band director, and he had his, he had his degree. And, uh, and he uh, actually learned uh, all the instruments. He could play all the instruments. He played piano very well. He used to play uh, tunes in two different keys. And, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and as I put on, he was quite a, a card. <laughs> and, and he would play uh, just regular tunes and, and play them in two different keys. And it almost sounded right because it was so, he was going at it and smiling and everything. And people would hear it and say, boy, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> and he was a, uh, he was one of the um, uh, higher um, uh, educators in Florida. He started the All-State Jazz Band in Florida in the in the early 60s. Oh, wow. And um, uh, I grew up in a house where my, my brothers and sisters were all uh, musicians. My oldest brother Eben was a tuba player uh, who later became a Navy SEAL. Uh, he was an uh, expert in beekeeping and he ended up being a um, beekeeper for the state of California. Mm. And uh, my next to the uh, oldest brother, Ernie, is a trombone player that lives up in Reno. And my younger sister, Mary Kay, is a bassoonist that uh, teaches uh, school in Panama City, Florida, and has won many awards for her uh, taking kids and um, having them uh, just flower as young musicians in the, in the early, early grades, in the mid-school and um, at least she, she, she has like these uh, reggae bands and stuff where they're playing steel drums and one of the other kids will be playing bass and then on the next tune they'll switch instruments. So they all learn different, different instruments and, uh, and sang and, and it was a, a joyful experience for them and she, she's a great teacher. Great. So it was in, inbred in my home with my, my father I grew, um, uh, my dad used to say to me, he says, uh, son, you have no tone, but 
no technique. <laughs> and, and it was time for me to get in the back room and practice a little bit, you know. And, uh, and he, um, uh, but in my home, uh, I was in, uh, grew up in <clears throat> pretty much northern Florida, which is pretty much redneck <laughs> country. And, and uh, you know, they had white fountains and black fountains to drink out of water fountains, and uh, it was pretty segregated. So, uh, the, uh, but in my home, I had Louis Armstrong and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, Clifford Brown, mm. Dizzy Gillespie, Duke mm -hmm. Ellington's band. And, 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 you know, my folks told me that um, it didn't matter the color, it, it, you know, the, it, that uh, it was the, the, the black musicians were the innovative of jazz and stuff. So I grew up with that in, in, my, in my home and, and never had that kind of uh, a temperament toward my fellow mm -hmm. men, you know, my fellow mm -hmm. people. So it was a good good experience growing in my uh, growing up in my house my dad was revered as one of the best band directors in florida and he helped thousands and thousands of kids i still get uh, letters from uh, from people that he influenced and gave them directions in their lives whereas a young uh, a kid that was going through troubled whatever in the home or in the experiences at school or whatever he gave them purpose in music and uh, that's the beautiful part about the arts, isn't it? It certainly is, no if question. You, if you go into the, and, and start uh, being introverted and practicing and, and producing beautiful sounds, it, there's a payoff, mm -hmm. you know? Indeed, yeah. Well, it's easy to see where you got your spirit then, and you have a, you know, such passion for music, and, and like you're dead, you've inspired hundreds of us, so uh, it's, it's great that you're carrying that on. Thank you. Um, Let's talk about North Texas State a little bit. I think that's the first time when I was in high school, I would always go to Tower Records in San Jose and look at the North Texas Lab Band. And I remember seeing your name as lead trumpet. I think it was Lab 67, 68, 68 something yeah. like that. And uh, I remember also looking at that time, I was, became aware of you as a professional. And, and, and I started seeing some other names like Tom Malone and Lou Marini, who I would see. So what was your experience like? And, and in particular, I mean, that's one of the legendary jazz programs of all time, of course, and it's still an amazing uh, program today. But what was your experience like being around all those other great young players at that point in your life? It was, it was exciting. It was extremely exciting. Let me back up just a little bit to when I left my home in yeah. Florida. I had an opportunity to go to some colleges on scholarship, on musical scholarships. But I didn't want to be a burden anymore to my, my folks. They were both teachers. Uh, we never missed a meal, but we didn't, uh, we didn't eat lobster, I can tell you that. <laughs> and and uh, so I joined the Navy, both my brother and I did, and I served for four years. Oh, okay. And I did two tours of duty in Vietnam and the Gulf of Tomkin on an aircraft carrier. I was part of the band. And uh, I, I uh, sort of had an awakening that if I wanted to uh, be a, a professional musician, I need to get busy and, and, um, and in every aspect. And I did do that. I practiced six, seven hours a day. I was able to do that in the service. Um, I had my whatever, praise the Lord, and pass the ammunition jobs. And, and then I would uh, uh, hit that back room and, and work out with the recon marines and run and try to do everything physically I could to uh, deal with the air and, and move the air and have plenty of it and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And I searched out, um, I was at the, um, uh, down, based down in San Diego and I searched out Bud Brisboy. I heard him play uh, blues with a touch of elegance. He played Flamingo with the uh, Ozzy Matthews' big band. And I went, wow, man, listen to him, man. He's just beautiful. And uh, I did find his number, and he, I did call him up and went up to, uh, I didn't have a car at that time. I took a bus. It took me 10 hours from San Diego because I didn't know the bus system, so I would leave the day before and stay up all night in a restaurant because I couldn't afford a room, and just wait for my lesson. You know, I just just thinking, man, this is going to be great, man. I don't care, you know. 
And, uh, and Bud would uh, pick me up the next day and say, when did you get in? I said, oh, about 8 o'clock last night. And he says, I, he says well, what did you? I said, I just stayed up waiting for the lesson. And he, I think that was um, uh, one of the reasons why he kept me as a student, because he knew I really wanted it. Clearly, you know? wow. So I studied with Bud for a couple of years. And Bud, one of the things Bud would uh, give me uh, to do was not, he had a book. Uh, that was uh, exceptional, exceptional uh, book uh, for the, the whole register, the trumpet and the upper register. Uh, he could do amazing things uh, to triple C. It was, it was he was, uh, you know, and he was, uh, but, he, but he gave me a book called World Statesman, which was a Dizzy Gillespie book. And it had, it had the record, and the, the head of the tune plus written out solos that Dizzy played. So you could hear him play the solo and then you would mimic it yourself. And so uh, he said, listen, it, this goes up to G's and A's. Um, and you can, <clears throat> if you can play this like Dizzy's feel, then you're, you're really embracing a lead trumpet player's mm. style. Mm. And so I thought that was a, a good basis for um, a studying any anything with the being a lead trumpet player uh, is is being a jazz player. The the best lead players that I've ever played with are all jazz players, very good jazz players, and they just got that thing, and they understand the time and they they and the they put the put the slant on it. That's just a natural feel. So when I heard, when I did that, I, I um, was getting out of the Navy, I got out earlier, and then that's when I went to North Texas. And I, okay. they didn't know I was coming in. They had a, they had, they, they knew from the year before, the summer before, who was the trumpet player was there. They had 10 bands. And so I, I threw a, a, a wire in the spokes and, and, Everybody had to move down, and I got the I audition and got the first trumpet uh, uh, in the one o'clock band there. And it was, uh, I called my folks. I was so excited to be playing with them. That's where I met Tom Bones Malone. Mm -hmm. He was my roommate at North Texas, and uh, uh, what a great guy! Yeah, absolutely. and what a great musician! Yeah, and every aspect of uh, my relationship with Tom still carries over. 45, 40, 50 years later today. And uh, there was a very good, very good player. Lou, Lou Marini was in the band. And so I, I met all these great young players and, and there were some okay ones in the service, but at North Texas or any of the schools like Berkeley, Ohio State had a good program. Indiana had a terrific program. Uh, schools around the country, but North Texas was the big band center. And not only that, the road bands would pick from that, and that's where I was heading. I knew I needed to get out on the road. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went there, and uh, it was a great experience. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing all that about the Navy experience as well, and then your experience with Bud. That's uh, great stuff to hear. And. Uh, Amazing to see that dedication and determination, and you hit that young age. You, you had it. You yeah. have to do that yeah. one time or another, and you have to sort of hang with it uh, throughout your life because uh, uh, any brass instrument, uh, as you well know, uh, you, you just got to stay with it and apply yourself because you're talking about muscles and. If you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, well said. Well, leading into uh, referencing the big bands, you, you joined Woody Herman following um, uh, North Texas. Maybe you could take us through that period. And also, I think, did that lead you to Hawaii? I know uh, shortly thereafter, you also went to Hawaii and spent some time there. I did. Um, I, was, uh, when I, went, I left North Texas and went out with uh, Bob Crosby and the Bobcats, and I was with them for about a month. And then from there, I joined the Billy Maxted and his Manhattan Jazz Band. And that was two trumpets, clarinet and trombone. And um, that was really authentic Dixieland, which was a great experience to do. Uh, we were at the Covington, Covington Inn in Indianapolis, uh, one morning, and 
we did a late hang that evening, and at six in the morning, we looked across the street, which was the club, and it was bellowing smoke out of it. And all the music was in the club, on the bandstand, and he had no score or no copy of the charts. Oh, wow. And they were all originals, and I went over there, and they busted down the side door of the club, and smoke came bellowing out, bellowing out, and the firemen were there with masks and oxygen tanks and everything, and they were getting ready to go in with the hoses, and, and I talked to him, and I said, listen, I'm in the band, I can hold my, tr my breath for three minutes. I says, please, have a fireman accompany me. I says, the bandstand is right here. I must get the music or the band is gonna be unemployed. And they said, okay, let's go. And we went in there and I held my breath and I scooped up all the music. And because you couldn't see, it was totally black inside. And, and I got all the music, came out, and they, some other fireman grabbed the bass and threw it out the door. And it was uh, uh, Sutcliffe was his name, the bass player from London. And it was a quite old bass. And when it came, I saw it come out the door and I had already put down the music and I grabbed the bass and saved that from hitting the ground. So I was a sort of oh a hero of that experience, wow. you know. Yeah. Billy Maxdab was an old time rough band leader that when you left his band, it was gonna be a fist fight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, he was, he was tough, you know. Right. He would punch you, you know, not the chops, but he would hit you pretty dang good and, and be mad that you were going to leave, and he lost a lot of uh, great players to uh, Woody and mm -hmm. and Buddy Rich and mm -hmm. into the other bands, and uh, and when I left, he gave me a hug. He didn't hit me because I saved his book. Yeah, you know? I would <laughs> think so. <laughs> so that and then I did go on to Woody's band, and um, that was another experience of um, that you only get really with a road band. It's it's. Um, when, when we try to duplicate the big bands, even today, it's not, not the same. Yeah. It's not the same of playing, the, playing those same charts, traveling, getting on a bus, you're playing with great musicians on the road, and it's, it's things that we're trying to speak about, ready, man, it, putting it down there, when those bands just did that. Mm -hmm. And you would hear that and you say, yeah, that's the, that, the feel is the last thing you learn. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, challenge for younger musicians that they don't have that experience to go out and get that. They get it in the colleges. It's not the same. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as being, being paid to play and being out on the, ro on the road. And it's a shame, um, but th that's the changing times. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I couldn't agree more. I know for me, coming out of school and then getting a, to spend two years on Buddy Rich's band, I felt like like it was just like a graduate program in itself. I mean, it was just like a finishing school, like you're really applying stuff that you'd learned, and then you'd learn, just like you said, I mean, being on the bus, and then you, it doesn't matter whether you feel like playing or not, get up there and play, you're, you're a professional now, and you learn that work ethic, and, and, and of course, what you said musically, the, 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 the feel factor becomes so much more important. You know? When I was with Woody's band, eight out of the 16 in the band were junkies. And I remember Nat Pavone, who, of course, most of them are dead, were, uh, was such a wonderful player. I mean, he had a thing that would, because he played lead with Maynard, he was, he, uh, 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 had a long, he, he's already well seasoned. And, you know, it, it, with, the, with the heroin and him falling asleep a lot and just on the bandstand, it was like learning to deal with that with a person. But when he picked up his horn, it was amazing. Mm. It, he, projection, feel, time. And so, you know, we have these preconceived ideas about people that have a certain um, monkey on their back or problems in life, and you, under, you start learning, and wow, listen to that lead trumpet playing he's doing. And you go, maybe I should take a different look at this, this uh, uh, person and 
and especially my judgment of this person. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they were all wonderful, all wonderful players. Uh, Harry Hall and, and John Hicks who, who played with Miles and, and uh, just uh, 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 Sal Nestico. Mm -hmm. Oh uh, yeah, that's right, Sal. And he was on the band and, and so it was a great, great experience that, that is, uh, I mean, where are you going to go out and travel with a bunch of dope addicts? <laughs> <laughs> it was really good. I'm telling you, it was really good. You just had to, you know, not go there yourself. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, in 1975, you made what was obviously a life-changing move to here to Los Angeles. And uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about what your memories are of arriving in LA and what, what caused you to make that move? I know you, I think you knew Chuck Finley from some meetings in Hawaii and whatnot and how that influenced you, you moving here. Oh uh, yeah, but the, well, I heard Chuck when he was 18 years old with, or 19 years old with Buddy Rich's band and I, and I just fell in love with him. I said, man, this guy can really, really play. He's a, he's a free spirit and he's a loving spirit, and he's just always been that way. He's been my mentor from those days, and still is. <laughs> <laughs> and he, um, uh, I, I met him down in in, uh, in San Diego, and um, when I was in the Navy, and then after Woody's band, I came back to L.A. and I moved to Hawaii, and that's where I met Jerry. Oh, okay. And I became, that's when Jerry used to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> for a lot less money, I may add. And, and uh, 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 what a wonderful uh, uh, timing that was in my life to meet Jerry and Larry Hall and Larry Williams and Bob Wilson, all these guys that were part of Sea Wind. And uh, we formed a group, and I was a part of that for a brief instant. And then it just developed into a, a seven-piece group that went out on the road, eight-piece. Sometimes Larry would go, Larry Hall would go out with them. But I, I met Jerry as a trumpet player, and I, I said, "Man, I said I can't, I can't believe somebody that has so much versatility on the horn and sounds so good." in any style of music. Because Jerry, when he grew up, he, he played nothing but uh, C trumpet for two years in high school. Uh, and uh, he was, uh, he, he knew all the Bitch book and the Transcendantes book and the Charlier book. He knew every exercise in there by memory. And, and, then, uh, and then you play um, uh, Joy Spring or, or one of uh, Freddie's tunes, and then he played their solos, mm -hmm. you know? So he had, and he had an ex extreme range, and it was just impressive in every aspect, sound-wise, concept, reading, any instrument, perfect pitch, uh, and just, uh, I just went, wow, in the middle of Hawaii. So uh, I became like the guy in the charge, I was a little bit older, three or four years older than anybody else and had been on the road, so they sort of put me in charge over there with the guy that was contracting. And I was able to have Chuck come over and do some gigs and, 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 uh, and of course he just dazzled everybody every time he came, you know, we just, we, we, it was all about music in Hawaii. Again, it was extending more. It was, um, uh, you know, three or four hours a day practicing, doing shows, and having, I had a big band that uh, was the nucleus, the Sea Wind was the nucleus of the group, and, and with the other people from Hawaii. Had a, another small group there called Tanless, which was a, a, a nine-piece, eight-piece uh, jazz group, which was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So the creative aspect was, was really good. Uh, with the musicians and the playing and the uh, uh, just everybody was busy trying to get ready for the next you know chapter in our lives mm -hmm. and then I did after that uh, Chuck Chuck sort of said Gary you gotta come back to LA you know you you you'll do good there so I did and, and for the first year, Chuck sent me in on, on dates, and I, I, did, I didn't, it was a five-year town at that time in Los Angeles, uh, <clears throat> to get uh, where you could make a living mm -hmm. as a studio musician. They had a lot of work, but they had the pecking order. Mm 
Mm -hmm. A lot of musicians here, but a lot of work. And uh, and Chuck would send me in on on on, um, on his gigs. He'd take them, and he was he was just like he was like a chicken with his head cut off. He was running <laughs> from this date to that date, and he would get into scheduling problems. And he'd call me up and say, "Gary, you got to go into RCA, and and uh, there's a uh, Barbara Streisand date or whatever date it was." and cover me, and I said, I'll be there, and I'd walk in, Chuck would rehearse it, I'd sit down, I'd record it, he'd leave and go to his next gig, and, you know, it was just so busy, and we were, of course, Jerry followed over here after that into L.A., so that's when um, that whole thing started to develop, you know, and I, I became busy after one year. Mm. So I, I, I cheated the, the five-year bit. Not surprising uh, bring, what you bring to the table. Um, that's really uh, great to hear your, uh, the recollections about meeting your association with Chuck. And uh, he is an amazing guy, as you, as you uh, well said. Um, I think I really became familiar with your playing through the great work you did with Jerry. And uh, you just mentioned him. Maybe you could talk about the evolution of that section. I think, for my money, I... I it's hard to imagine there'll ever be a horn section of, at that level. And a lot of it, of course, is every single player was just amazing. Certainly the combination of you and Chuck and Jerry together is something that's I've never heard before that and I haven't heard it since. Um, can you talk about maybe your relationship with Jerry and how, you know, maybe even a couple of your favorite projects that you guys have done? You've done so many. I'm sure it's hard to single anything out, but maybe just your thoughts about I, that. I could go on for hours. And, <laughs> and it's... Uh, Jerry Hay, um, this developed with, um, they were doing, um, I think George Benson, CWIM was, and, and Quincy heard him and said, you know, and he, and he called up um, uh, Jerry and asked him if he'd write an arrangement for the Brothers Johnson. I think there was even something before that. We did the Jackson 5 before Michael went out on his own. And uh, we did the Brothers Johnson. We went in and we played that. And we played this one tune that the the vamp was ridiculously long. It was longer than the tune. And that those days were taped. There was no cut and paste. It was all, every note was being played. And we played this vamp and it went up to double C's and, and we never stopped. And we never stopped on the, that and then we double tracked it and did the same thing again. And Jerry would do some different voicings on the double track, which made it sound good independently, yet complement the double track. The thing about those times is that uh, th there was always a budget. So musicians always get the least amount of money. Uh, it, it's been that way, it's that way in the arts. So we had to, f Jerry figured a way of not only helping the the, the tunes, it just wasn't pop. It was McCoy Tyner, it was Maynard. It was a lot of different uh, musicians, that, uh, artists that, uh, uh, George Duke and, and stuff. And, and he found a way with, uh, we did Five Horns originally. And um, so we went in with the Brothers Johnson and we did actually uh, that kind of voicings and, and double tracking and um, uh, and it, it impressed Quincy so much that we left that evening and came back the next morning and we would continue on with some more tunes and Quincy had been there all night listening to what we did and he pulled us into the booth and he said, from now on, he says, you are my guys. And that's the way it was for that 20 years that I was playing first for Quincy, everything he did, we did. And Jerry became his sort of right hand man and very good friend they're, they are uh, musical uh, geniuses, both of them. And, and um, uh, uh, Quincy, so Quincy was getting hot. He left A&M as an A&R guy and was going out on his own. He did the Brothers Johnson, which did very well. And then he got hooked up with Michael, and of course the rest is history from there. Mm. And that really launched him as a producer, of course, he's done many things over the over the years in New York and in L.A. and many, and and was. I remember asking Jerry one time. I said, you know, Jerry, does Q really know what he's doing with voicings? 
And Jerry set me straight. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're, we're dealing with a very musical, knowledgeable person with uh, Quincy Jones and, and with uh, Jerry's uh, mind. He's one of the smartest people uh, that I know because wh when they hired us, it didn't matter about, you know, they said, well, how, what is this going to cost? And Jerry would say, well, um, we're going to double track, so it's going to be double scale for everybody. And so you get paid double scale, right? And which was, they didn't like to do that. And uh, if they could get away with it, but they wanted us because we were making the hits and there was never any problem about it. And it was a way to get around, well, this, these guys are really worth double scale. And, and it was a way for us to make good money, play great music, and the organization of it all was phenomenal. Hmm. Jerry Hay is, is uh, if you haven't ever worked with him, which most people haven't, it's a joy. Even to this day, when, I, when he calls, I get excited. I do, it's just so together, and so, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, so many times, he would be speaking with the artist, who's a keyboard player, and the involved changes, and it'd be some weird changes in there in seven, and Jerry would say, well, it's a D flat seven uh, uh, plus nine flat thir 13 over E flat or something, you know? And the guy would say, oh, uh, I don't think so. And then Jerry reaching his hand and pull out some money. <laughs> and he'd look at me and he'd say, you want to bet? <laughs> And this is the guy that, that actually wrote, wrote the song. And they would take the time to solo the piano, and that's exactly what it was. He was, he was phenomenal in what his ears were telling him and what it really was and what we were playing in the relationship with that. A lot of times uh, with four guys, especially when you go to double track on the other side, the, 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 it can be some funny notes that accentuate what we're doing uh, to the track that will be added on, on, on this other side in a way where it's, it's there, but it's not knocking you, knocking you down, but it's there, mm -hmm. you know? And he was a genius at doing that, mm -hmm. really, really phenomenal. And just, uh, I can't say a, a, enough about him, you know, and uh, I was lucky to, and I wanted to be that. I wanted to be part of that, that music. It was, um, I think that as a young musician, the, the biggest thing, the biggest teachers have been the players for me. Um, you know, playing with Chuck Finley, playing with Malcolm McNabb, certainly playing with Jerry Hay, playing with Snooky Young. Playing with all these great musicians, there's your teachers. You can get the same thing by listening to the records that they're on and mimicking that. <clears throat> really getting inside that, that's a good teaching apparatus for us, a teaching tool for uh, young musicians. But always get to the uh, best players that you can play with because uh, everybody's got the same uh, abilities or even better than yours, and that's where you learn. And so I was in hog heaven. I was uh, blessed with all these timings that I had, and, uh, and I was right back here with Chuck, playing with him, and Jerry and I and Chuck, Jerry would sit on the third book, I'd sit on the second book. Chuck was always at the last minute, you might say, arriving. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it didn't matter, but we get there a little early, make sure we got those lower books because we wanted him to lead us, lead us, lead the way for us. And, uh, and it was out of respect of his musicianship as much as it was anything. And therefore you had this brotherly love in the, in the section that was, uh, it was, it, it wasn't, you, you just couldn't slough something through and it not go unmentioned. <laughs> and so it was honest section and it was just fun as heck, you know. And um, 
you know, it's been, I, I, I have a, a laughter inside when I think about those days with us. Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, for me coming, I remember hearing you guys, I went to, I was on Buddy Rich's band, I went to, uh, a friend invited me to hear you guys play on a Manhattan Transfer recording, and I just, it's still one of the most amazing uh horn section brass thing, dates I've ever witnessed. It was just That was Charlie Loper, fun. right? Charlie Loper and, of course, Bill Reichenbach, my of my favorite of any uh, trombonist, and, and and Chuck and Jerry and, and yourself, and it was just, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I'd never heard anything like it. It was just a phenomenal on, sound. On one of the Al Jarreau tunes, Chuck and uh, Bill switched horns. Mm. <laughs> and Chuck played trombone and Bill played trumpet, recorded it. You know, and I don't think they rehearsed it. I think it just went down. And uh, Bill Reichenbach, uh, what a phenomenal, phenomenal musician. Uh, sometimes the parts would be so difficult with Jerry that he would he would uh, fax me over a part, or saying, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, but if you know all this and. <laughs> And and I would and Bill would walk in. I said, Bill, man, we got this these parts to play, and they're really. I said, man, take a look at this. He says, I don't want to look at it. <laughs> I, I don't want to look at it. He says, I, he says, I don't want to think about it. He says, I'll deal with it when I get to it. And I used to think, hmm, there's something to this, <laughs> and it would be phenomenal how he would pull it off on trombone. You know, yeah. just. Uh, he, he's just, uh, uh, his time, his sound, everything about it was, uh, that's another uh, graduate of Eastman, uh, big, big time f musical family. His dad was a drummer. Sure. Bill plays drums. Bill's a composer. He's just, uh, so that was, that was then that, um, you know, uh, in that lower uh, oomph in the section that was just wonderful. Pitch wise, everything, timing, and um, uh, and then you got Larry Williams as uh, saxophone player or Dan Higgins, mm -hmm. who is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. They've always been the, really the cream of the crop, and I'm not saying that other guys that weren't there weren't cream of the crop, but these were the cream of part of that cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I just I can't even echo it enough about Bill Reichenbach, one of the great musicians of any instrument. But I think. That's the, just the way you, I could see him thinking that because he's such a consummate musician. He's just going to be able to bring the musicality that's going to get. And of course, technically, he's a virtuoso on every instrument he picks up. But the, the musicianship singing, always kind of like, yeah, it, yeah. Does, it is singing. It is singing because <laughs> his musicianship always leads the way. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah. and it's phenomenal, you know. It's, uh, yeah. A real yeah. joy. Well, thanks for sharing all those uh, stories and memories about that. That's uh, great stuff. And let's talk a little bit about you've done so much work in terms of motion picture work. Um, just maybe talk to us a little bit about that, how that might differ from, you know, working in a, on a record date and that type of thing. I walked in at Warner Brothers with Alan Silvestri. I did about 70 movies with Alan Silvestri. And uh, it was The Bodyguard, which we, we'd already... Uh, before we did the orchestra uh, recording for the movie, we'd already recorded with David Foster with Whitney Houston, I'll Always Love You, and uh, another tune on the record, which was, they, they knew that this, this uh, movie and combination record was going to be, it's going to make an impact. And um, the, uh, uh, I walk in and it was uh, militaristic, trumpet solo with 80 piece orchestra. And I sit down and I um, started playing it. And Jerry's over the side, him and Larry Hall, and they're, come on Gary, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> and uh, a, a militaristic is no vibrato, so you can't flower it, you can't bend the notes, you have to play it emotionally with without those, uh, those tools. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, I didn't like my sound that day when I started playing it. Um, and I was playing, I forget the mouthpiece at the time, a Bert Herrick or, I mean, a, a Bob Reeves. It, it was just, I, I'd been working hard playing other kind of stuff. And, and I 
was getting a little bit too bright of a sound, so I reached in my bag and I pulled out a 7C mouthpiece, which is a totally different mouthpiece. And, uh, and I said, you know, Warren Looney, who was a wonderful trumpet player, he's another one of those phenomenal trumpet players that grew up in Los Angeles, so it was a jazz player and one of my favorite lead players. He played a 7C and I said, shoot, I should play a 7C too. So I took out, put it in, and that's what I recorded that theme on was a 7C mouthpiece that I'd never played before. And I thought that was interesting. It's, it's sort of a tricking yourself um, at the moment to, you have a new equipment. And you know how you pick up a horn and you sound great right away? Right. And you, you always say, well, give yourself a week. You know, and then you can really have an opinion. Well, I sort of did that on this theme, you know, and uh, and it worked out great. Um, the 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 movie uh, did great. I remember getting the check from Talent Residuals. Once you do a movie, and I got paid well for the movie, I did. But once you do the movie and it goes to a record, there's a union fee of. Uh, that a certain amount of money that you get. And they took that cut from the theme of the bodyguard and they put it on the record. It was 11th cut and it says theme of the bodyguard by Alan Silvestri trumpet solo Gary Grant. And I'm looking at the record. It was a record. And uh, at that time they'd sold 18 million copies. And I still hadn't gotten paid for the record yet. And I finally get the check and it was for $290. And I'm sharing with my wife, you know, I says, you know, something's not right. I says, 18 million records, $15 a record or $12 a record, whatever it was there. And I'm getting $290 and I'm on the record as a soloist, so in a cut, and my check is $290. And the phone rings. It went down just like this. I answered the phone. It was Talent Residuals. May I speak to Mr. Grant? I says, Talent Residuals. Great, <laughs> this is, we messed up on your check. And I went, yes. They says, you, we overpaid you, would you send half of it back? So <laughs> I went, bye, you know. And uh, it was uh, it, it's sort of like everything's not always glamorous, you know, for the musicians. And I, I'm sure I could have done some kind of legal uh, uh, pursuit of uh, more money on that. but. I don't believe in lawsuits in the first place, uh, for the most part, and uh, uh, I don't have any judgment against people that do use them for the right reasons. But I'm certainly not going to do that because I have an agreement with the union and that's the way it worked out. So it was no big thing, but it's sort of a, a wake-up call that, that, and the record went on to sell 38 million copies. So uh, they made uh, a billion dollars off of it, and I made two hundred and ninety dollars. You know, so yeah, that's one of my. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's know? some. Uh, that's some insight, if there ever was uh, insight. <laughs> wow. Well, it, it goes to show you. I mean, of course, from our perspective, we love hearing you on that, and it impacts so many musicians. You know, and, and unfortunately, it doesn't always uh, extend to a financial uh, impact to yourself, but. Uh, but uh, it's a good, good story in a certain uh, kind of way. You know, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about your career as a producer. You've uh, doing incredibly well, doing some great projects. Uh, Malcolm McNabb was just here, and he, of course, you produced uh, his records, and he just calls you a genius. He said it's amazing, and on top of that, is there's no, you just keep going. He's, he was talking about one session you guys did at his studio, and. He said, I got to go to bed. I got to get up in the morning. And sure enough, he gets up and you'd been working all night and you're still there. To, uh, yeah, it, things he, had to be done. You know, and, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm sorry to yeah. interrupt you. But, and you won a Grammy last year for your work uh, with Arturo Sandoval, which I is did. obviously well-deserved. But maybe just talk to us a little bit about how you got into production. I know you're also a computer whiz. A lot of people have said you have incredible knowledge as far as Pro Tools and all that, uh, which is not surprising and also obviously great skills to have. And I think I think Bill Reichenbach, the great Bill Reichenbach said it best. He said, you know, Gary is passionate. He's a friend of music. He just cares so much about music. And I think all the great producers, you know, however you look at uh, Quincy Jones, of course, and uh, uh, all of them, 
they care about music and they care about what whatever you think Absolutely. sounds like. So, but anyway, I, I'm talking too much. Do you t tell us a little bit about how you got into producing and 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 what gives you that passion to work? Well, in that I was way. always interested in it, and uh, of course, in the you know in the 70s and 80s, if you wanted to buy a machine, you know. Uh, if it had Dolby on it, it was 80 grand. If you wanted to get a just a uh, uh, a board, uh, you know, you're talking 120 grand. Uh, and this is, was cheap uh, equipment. It wasn't really the best, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so, um, but I was always interested in doing that, and uh, I have pretty good people skill. And, um, and I have pretty good ears of being able to access what, what it is, is to, to pull out the magic at that point, you know, and how to do it without offending somebody and having them walk out of the room. Um, uh, Jeff Becquerel set his drums on fire one day at Capitol, <laughs> you know. <laughs> of course, they were, they were absurd with him, you know. Uh, they have, uh, you know, as, uh, it was uh, I, I produced mostly uh, trumpet players. Uh, I have a passion for uh, the trumpeters, and 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 uh, I was lucky to um, uh, produce uh, Wayne Bergeron. Uh, I I uh, did both of his records. We're in the middle of a third record at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and, and Wayne was one of those phenomenal young guys that came up that um, uh, had an, just, it's just not just his high notes, his, his reading concept, his phrasing, his playing. And um, I was involved with Chuck Finley's Star Eyes for his, his record that uh, helped him uh, master and put that together here. He recorded it over in Europe and it was a phenomenal, phenomenal record. Chuck played so beautiful and it was arranged by, um, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna say, Frunk, hmm. guy in, that was over there. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> and, and Wayne's records, <clears throat> I, said, when you, I said to Wayne, I says, you know, if you do your own records, I says, you'll be able to go out as, as a clinician and, and perform with uh, bands around the country and around the world, and, and you won't be uh, waiting by your phone as a studio sausage, waiting for work, and shouldering up to that. You'll be, uh, have a flexibility in your career, and you'll have all the expressiveness of uh, being a soloist, and, and go out and do that. And I said, there's a way to do both of them where they're in balance, and he's actually maintained that, and he's mm -hmm. very in demand, very demand in this town, and uh, and he's in demand throughout the world to go in as a soloist. Arturo was, um, I, I heard Arturo play, and I said, man, what happened? Those, those Cubans are laying down the law here, you know? <laughs> and and I, he just, he's such a wonderful, wonderful trumpet player, and he, and he really does have a heart of gold. He's, he's, He's a, a, a unique soloist that stands up on his own, and the things he does on the trumpet is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And of course, Malcolm, eh, he's another story. I, I would, I would uh, do movie calls with him, and uh, the the uh, and and at the end of the day, he would have these beautiful solos to to play with cello and flute. And he was playing so lyrically and so smoothly and beautifully, and uh, and I knew he was working on that Tchaikovsky violin concerto for years. He just would putz with it, and and, and he and he could play it. And so one day I says, you know, let's let's do it. Let's do a record on that, and I'll I'll help you put all that together. And uh, and that's what we did. We went after that, and um, the. Uh, uh, the records uh, with Arturo, you know, Arturo's a, a, a true jazz player. When he plays something, he's got the horn in the case. <laughs> he's, he's walking out the door because that's the real deal. And 
sometimes uh, I will say he says I'm I'm as uh, I'm the toughest guy he's ever worked with because uh, but I do we we do listen and and we can fix things especially in the technology today a lot of things we don't have to most we don't have to some things you 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 want to you can do that so why not and. And uh, Arturo uh, will do that, and and no problem. And it's always he's he he really takes uh, what I say uh, as 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 a valid reason to look at it and listen to it, and and make sure that is. I always leave the choice up to the artist, mm -hmm. but I point out what what it is that I'm hearing, and do they want to do anything about it? And usually, most of the time, 99% of the time, they do. And because you want to keep, you don't want to mold somebody, especially at this level, you want to capture mm. what they do, creativity, and, uh, and their creative uh, aspect. And I think that's important as a producer. Uh, I've, um, uh, this Tango record that I won a, a Grammy for last year, uh, co-producing it with Arturo, um, the uh, I've never made a lot of money producing. Uh, uh, it's it's been it's it's a passion of mine to be able to to work with these uh, these trumpet players, and uh, and I hope to be producing Sergei Nekaterkov mm. very soon. Uh, he was in Phoenix playing with the Phoenix Symphony, and I went over and I, I never met him before, and I went and stayed at the same hotel, sort of like stalking, <laughs> and. And, and I called him up and I said, I was there, I was coming, and, and um, the first thing I did, I says, uh, are you hungry? <laughs> and he says, yeah, I'm a little hungry. I said, let's go. And I found out the best place, and went and took him and gave him the dinner and went over and, and, uh, at the hall and, and sat in his dressing room while he warmed up and went out and did the Mendelssohn and played a flawless, beautiful concert. Then after that, he came back and he practiced another hour, and I just sat in there minding my own business and minding Sergey's too, <laughs> and and it was just uh, uh, and then I invited him. Uh, he had a uh, he had a week off and he was going to go get on a new uh, luxury liner and all out of the Bahamas with the uh, London um, uh, Chamber Orchestra, which is considered one of the best in the world, with uh, with. Uh, Bell and and all these marvelous soloists and he had a week off and I said why don't you come and stay with me in LA let me introduce you to the the uh, musical community here and he did he came over and I I, I just um, uh, uh, just love him to pieces man he's a, a gentle soul and he's such a good trumpet player um, I had I told him when he walked into my house. I says, "Man, you can play it any time you want to." I, I didn't even want to play around him. I swear I didn't I, because he was just he doesn't do a routine. He his routine is his repertoire. So you know, and I'm practicing practicing exercises and stuff like that. And I asked him, "Well, what kind of routine do you do?" And he says, "I I don't." He says, "My repertoire is my routine," and. That was another eye opener, because uh, but it's 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 not like just get up and just start playing. It's very introverted, very purposeful, long tones, some melody from some piece that he's going to play, where he's and he plays a little bit and he stomps, then he continues playing, and you can see how mm -hmm. it's how it's purposeful practicing mm -hmm. that he's doing, you know. So he's, uh, I've already spoke with him and he wants me to do it, so I, hopefully I'm going to do that in the future. That's awesome. That'll be another match made in heaven. I mean, everybody you, I know I've been speaking to uh, uh, Wayne and, uh, and Malcolm, they just echo the same sentiments that uh, you get the best out of them. And uh, that's, that's a real, that's a separate level of uh, talent and skill. Than, uh, than, and then, of course, you bring the incredible musicianship, so it's a great... Uh, a great package. Um, let's talk a little bit about your solo CDs. You have two solo CDs out, and I and I love this cover, which you were kind enough to bring. And uh, I don't know if you can zoom in on that, Tim, and I get that. But maybe I know I know the focus is the music on it. But this is such a cool cover. Maybe you could tell us how you actually got this uh, photo. Yeah, uh, since we deal with breath, I was 
the name of the record is Don't Hold Your Breath. And of course, with a brass instrument, you can't. And uh, I first saw Ollie Mitchell do a shot down in his pool. He had a picture of him playing down in the bottom of his pool with his trumpet. And I said, man, that's, that's pretty unique. So I went, I have a timeshare down in Cancun, and I went out onto a dive boat. I'm a, a, I dove all over the world as a scuba diver. I really enjoy that. The, uh, just getting underneath the ocean and swimming with nature and fish and stuff, and, and I stay off the reefs. I know I'm an advanced scuba diver. I respect the ocean. Uh, I love sh swimming with sharks. Uh, the the uh, you know you become <clears throat> with with the ocean. They 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 know who you are and they feel your vibes. And uh, of course, I've never swam with a great white. <laughs> Find out what I'm made of if we do that. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm not fearful of those things. And and I and I I thought, man, wouldn't it be nice to get a, a cover? of me playing down, actually playing down in the ocean. So I hired this underwater photogra photographer and I went down underwater about uh, 35, 40 feet, maybe 30 feet, something like that. And I had, I had him give me my Bach Strad, brand new Bach, and I went down and got on the bottom and took my mask off, put on my shades, <laughs> Pinked up, let it go. So you got the bubbles coming out the bell, you know, and everything. And it's, there was <laughs> this is just like it's phenomenal. It's and now hearing the story of because I remember seeing that and I thought, I wonder how he got that in the sink. Is that this photo for shot? real? It's yeah, from, that's it, what I thought. For real. It was there was shot. there was sharks there and there was other fish, and they didn't pay any attention to me. It was amazing, <laughs> and I just went. To, I did a whole bunch of pictures with it, even the the dive shop owner came to see who this was playing a trumpet underwater <laughs> and uh, and uh, the uh, I, you know I watched the horn real good it didn't hurt it it's, it's okay <laughs> great stuff that is really cool well Gary you've you've I mean you've just done it all and, and given us all so much inspiration and in everything you do uh, it's been over 40 years that you've been playing at this remarkable level what uh, and I like like Malcolm said, you're the type of guy who's going to stay up all night and get it done and do the work that's. Uh, and I know you bring so much passion. What's the future hold for you? And what are you looking at in terms of music? What are you focusing on for? The, I know you mentioned the. Sergey is one of them, and Chuck Chuck Finley. I want to do a record with Chuck. Mm. Um, the uh, uh, it's not that I just produce trumpet players, but they're usually the album is a trumpet. Uh, you know, because I, I produced. Uh, you know Dan Dan Higgins and, and Pete Chrisleaf and and Joe, uh, Bob Shepard and and uh, Vinny and and uh, many many other kind of musicians, but the the actual artist is is that is that kind of person and and Chuck is the other one. I love to do uh, orchestra. Mm. Uh, I've got some uh, that in the works and and um, I think that in this time this is. March the 22nd, is that mm -hmm. correct? That's right, yeah. 2014, and we are going to see a whole bunch of great things happen for the arts and for the creativity of the human race. We are all in slavery. And um, this is going to be a distant memory, not too f long from this point. Uh, we've been subjected to a lot of hardships. Of course, the arts are the ones that struggle the most during any any kind of change in society and uh, and and changes in the world uh, the <clears throat> uh, not to uh, diminish what is popular in the pop world uh, but when people hear music from the 70s or the 60s or the 80s it's different than what you hear now because of the harmonic content is so much less than it used to be in those days when I mean, you listen to Earth, Wind, and Fire, or uh, you know, and you go back into the 50s and the 40s, then you're going to get back into the swing era and uh, and where you really could walk around humming a tune. Uh, so this advent of of uh, this influx of of this rebellious. Um, approach 
of, that ties into to kids and children and also a, a higher purpose of creating violence in society, that is ran its rampant, uh, it's just ran its course. And the, usually things are in circle. So the, I'm, I'm speaking a little vague at this point because it, it's, it's, um, it's, it has everything to do with the age that we're in. We're in the age of Aquarius. We're in the feminine in energy. There's a lot of awakening going to go on and a lot of healing going on on the planet and it's happening right now mm -hmm. with all of us. Um, my wife is dealing with um, uh, four stage cancer and it's uh, hit my house, it hits everybody's house. It's sort of like misfunctioning families. And it's this, this, the struggle for us to be liberated and free people is ongoing with all of us. Nobody's different. So I, what, I am, what I'm doing is to, to stay focused in my craft where I apply myself with uh, my, uh, my, my love for the, for the music, because we're part, of the, we're part of the solution. We're not part of the problems. We're not making war, we're spreading joy. And when people listen to music, I think it's just so, so much, it's so important for mankind, for us to be uh, doing those kind of, uh, endeavors for mankind. I mean, I just think it's, it's it, and it's not just the music, it's all the arts. And, uh, and I think that this is going to come and it's going to blossom for us very soon where we're going to get some relief from this stranglehold that is put on the human race. And in fact, I know it's happening. It's, this is, we can, we can really feel good about where we've come from and how this is going to blossom for all of us as human beings. Hmm. Inspiring words, Gary. Boy, I mean, I just in spending this hour with you, I mean, I've always just been such a huge fan of you as a musician, but as a person, you are an amazing individual. So thank you for sharing all that. And my last question, which I usually try to end with all our great artists, is just, you know, there's so many of us my age that look and see, I want to be like Gary Grant when I grow up. And, uh, I know there are young people out there that, that are thinking that, and um, if you had to kind of pare it down to just a little bit of advice that you'd offer a young person right now who might want to be a trumpet player or a producer, or what, uh, if, it, if it's possible to encapsulate uh, the many experiences, what advice would you give to, to them? I would think that apply yourself, uh, be purposeful with your time that you do on that application, if you're going to be a trumpet player or any musician, you should, you should uh, really spend some time with your instrument and really, really know how to play it. Uh, Staying, you know, I think being non-judgmental is the most difficult thing for all humans. It's been inbred in us that, you know, that that's the way it is. Well, it really isn't the way it is. We are all loving human beings and respect our fellow man. And being unjudgmental to other people and about other things. So a lot of times musicians will, to get a, a barometer of where their musicianship is, is that they will scrutinize somebody else and say, well, yeah, they can do that, but they can't do this, and they can't do that, and they can't do that. So the whole conversation is, is around of what they can't do and what you don't like about it. I, I think that's, that's in the, it's in the struggle of, of learning yourself to become a great musician and be, be uh, in, in my mind, I want to play something that makes people go, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. And I think we all want to do that. And people that don't care about who they're playing it for, then they, they can play. Uh, I don't think that's uh, really truthful. Uh, no matter what it is, if they put their heart and their soul in it, then, then it's, it, it, it means something. Hmm. Those are great words. And 
Gary, once again, thank you for uh, all the inspiration you've given us over the years, and thank you for taking the time today to spend uh, and share your incredible insight. It's been uh, really a pleasure. So thank Mike, you. Mike, thank you for having me, man. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. We will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick.